Right, well, here we are. I'm Matt Line, and we are streaming. Uh, it's about half an hour after we usually begin, and I am very sorry that we got to a late start. I'm not entirely certain what I could have done to expedite the process, but whatever it is, I will figure it out and uh, attempt so to do. I actually wound up oversleeping this morning for the first time in, uh, well, not nearly a long enough time. Need to have a uh, better alarm in place. <coughs> Either way, I made it as soon as I could, and I hope that you'll forgive me. Today we're going to uh, talk about the Iliad Book 3, uh, lines 526 and following. Uh, 540 is the last line of Book 3, so it's not very much. Um, we may continue a bit into Book 4, and then there's a few other things uh, to discuss as well. Uh, namely involving uh, a math, uh, in, involving memorization, and involving um, just generally keeping yourself in a shape of being able to um, do what needs to be done, whatever your role happens to be. So I'll uh, take a little note of that, and we can continue. But Menelaus, like a lion, ranged. Uh, this is after Paris is gone. And uh, supposedly was going to fight him, and then evaded death a few times, and, and then ran away, as opposed to fighting to the death as was promised. But Menelaus, like a lion, ranged, the multitude inquiring far and near. For Paris lost, yet neither Trojan him nor friend of Troy could show whom else through love. None had concealed for him as death itself, all hated, but his going none had seen. Amidst them all then spake the king of men, Trojans and Dardans and allies of Troy. The warlike Menelaus hath prevailed, as is most plain, now therefore bring ye forth, Helen with all her treasures also bring such large immersement as is met meet, a sum, to be remembered in all future times. So spake Atreides, and Achaia's host, with loud applause, confirmed the monarch's claim. So Menelaus beats Paris fair and square. Paris runs away. Nobody can seem to find him. And if we are to believe Homer, nobody actually liked Paris in the first place, and they wouldn't have had any qualms turning him in, so it would became an especially big uh, deal. It became an especially big deal for him to uh, have been able to escape with his life. So, with that all said, what can we learn? Well, perhaps one of the biggest things we can learn, and I don't know if this is even supposedly the, supposed to be the lesson, but the whole point of the Trojan War was, was uh, two parties with two armies going to war over one of them absconding with the other's wife. In this whole story, I mean, obviously you wind up having a later Achilles uh, fighting and so on, and that whole situation was 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 one 
huge farce. It was one huge tragedy. And the way things the, the way things worked out was just plain old wrong. Um, but I suppose if we can learn anything, it's it's mostly that life isn't fair. There are some instances where we go and we do everything we can, and still things don't work out for us. Now, does this stop us from doing what we need to do? I certainly hope not. I certainly hope not. Because we're not guaranteed anything. The only guarantee we have is that we can pick courses of action that can minimize bad odds and maximize good odds. But no matter how powerful we are or how powerless we are, there are always a variety of possible outcomes for our actions. And this is, I suppose, part of the reason why Aristotle and those of the Western tradition of philosophy, or at least many of the, of the prominent people of the Western tradition of philosophy, emphasize virtue as opposed to results. That there, are, that there are certain ways of conducting yourself that are inherently good and certain ways of conducting yourself that are inherently bad. And then you wind up having people trying to discuss and figure out, well, what is the good way? What is the bad way? And that's a conversation. Many people have many different answers to that question. And <clears throat> we all, I think, after cogitating for a long enough time, can come to some sort of a conclusion on the matter. Because ultimately, um, we all have a certain system of values. And however convoluted it may be, we decide on courses of actions based on that set of values. All the time. So even if we don't have an explicit if, 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 if we uh, take the easy way out and say that, well, I can't say that there would actually be any right or wrong, that doesn't mean there isn't any right or wrong. It just means that part of our definition of right and wrong is not acknowledging the words right and wrong to have a place in our life, which some people might see as the right thing to do. All right, that's like saying I'm going to be tolerant of everybody except for the people that are intolerant. Well... Or I'm going to be tolerant of everyone that I like. Well, no, you don't have to be tolerant. That's not tolerant at all. Tolerant would be tolerant of people that you don't know, whatever. It's the same general line of 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 lack of of lack of logic. Oh hello everyone who happens to be watching the stream. Welcome. There we go. I see already three people are watching. Great to see. Now, the the next topic, because we can go into the the, the, the response. We could go straight into book four. But finishing up book three was all I really wanted to do for today. <clears throat> as well as jumping into this little thing on virtue. And uh, we talked about Ben Franklin in uh, one of the previous episodes. And he attempted to break down uh, being virtuous through his studies in 2, 13 different virtues that he would cycle through on a weekly basis and go through four times a year. And I would say that list is very good. I'm not going to say that it's completely thorough, but I am going to say that it gives a good starting point. 
And the nice thing about those virtues are that, or any virtue, is that it's contingent only upon my behavior. It's not contingent upon what anybody else says or does. And then for you, the virtue would not be contingent upon anyone else's behavior except for your own. And that's a, I don't know, that's a big comfort. Because it takes an awful lot of the pressure for having particular results away. But it also necessitates us, or rather, if we want to have any peace, it puts us in the position of, it puts us in the position of needing to, on one hand, acknowledge that a certain set of results would be good, and on the other hand, be at peace with what comes our way while still aiming for more. And especially for those that have high expectations, that can be difficult. Balancing gratitude and happiness in the present with aiming for something more substantial in the future isn't, it isn't easy. It isn't the, 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 at least for me, it hasn't been the easiest thing to do. One of the biggest things I've been able to find in terms of, in terms of um, making sure the other stuff gets done. is health. It's taking care of yourself. Health uh, is, is, is probably the, the, the primary uh, the primary thing. Now we have especially in Western society uh, one of the biggest crises facing us is metabolic syndrome. Uh, killing us from the inside out and many of us who have it aren't even aware people that are fat a big subset I believe it's close to four out of five of them are either currently sick and don't know it or sick and do know it uh, from uh, what it is that they uh, that, that they eat but what people don't realize is that on account of the Western diet 40% of the people that are not fat or thereabouts almost half of the people that are not fat are somehow ill on account of what they eat What does that mean? What, what what does that signify? What does that like? How how does that? What's going on here? And I would I, I would say that it has an awful lot to do with um, the fact that for the longest time people have gotten in the habit of eating certain things and prioritizing certain things, and then force of habit tends to override anything else that's going on. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an evil thing if, if, if the habits are wrong. And that's why health and habits go hand in hand. We don't... And, and habits aren't only good for health, but starting the healthy ones can be, uh, can be very useful. And it can also make adopting other habits good too 
Uh, for example, uh, one of the people uh, who has who has been a uh, a very good uh, friend to me in real life, and I we are going uh, running on a consistent basis. So now it's not just me going running, or it's not just him exercising, but we've decided to get together and do that, and. It's only three mornings a week. I mean, there, there, there are four other, there are four other days. So he does, uh, he does the climbing. He does climbing on three of the other days, and then we take a day off. Um, I do calisthenics and, and stuff like that. But the whole point is that we're we're giving our bodies a chance to rest from the from the running that we do. Uh, and. Uh, running, we bike to the place. We go running. We run up and down <coughs> a hill. In in addition to just our normal, you know, aerobic aerobic training. And the interesting thing about the, the interesting thing about exercise is, yes, technically the people are right when they say exercise doesn't actually cause you to lose weight. That is a perfectly valid argument to make. The only thing that actually causes you to lose weight is by having more uh, calories burnt than consumed. But people neglect to, to understand that running or exercising in general has a, a beneficial aspect on your biochemistry. Specifically, you wind up getting an increase in, for instance, your cortisol levels at the time that you're running. You get an increase. You, you, you're, you're, you're stimulating yourself. You get some adrenaline, you get your endorphins, etc. And those biochemical changes are worth it. Those biochemical changes can be much more impactful than it would be just to lose weight. Well, Mr. Sanderson, uh, those biochemical changes um, are actually what, you, what we're going for. Physiological changes, hormonal changes, hormonal differences. And so, and so getting into a habit of keeping your hormones in check You think you totally agree with me, but you haven't been here that long. Um, well, right before you showed up, I'm pretty sure I said something about the flying spaghetti monster pooping out the universe. So, I don't know. Take that for what it's worth. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> this taking care of yourself thing and getting into a habit, whatever it may be, you know, it can be calisthenics, it can be stretching, it can be running, it can be walking, it can be biking, it can be a combination of all these different things. Getting your biochemistry um, under control is, is, uh, is, is important. And then the other thing is, I'm going to just keep on beating a dead horse because I'm that's that's the only thing I'm good at on these streams is stating the obvious over and over and over again. Um, one of the very the other important parts is what it is that we eat, and I would actually say that what is way more important than how much. What we eat is way more important than how much. It's interesting that people. Uh, before exogenous insulin was was isolated and, and injected into people, before people discovered you could do that, people actually had to go and correct diabetes with their, with their diet. And the solution was essentially getting out of high glycemic foods. Uh, foods with high glycemic index were out. Foods with high glycemic load were out. Um... No breads, no sugars, no none of that. No, basically, no no sugars, no starches, no sweets, or no sugars, no starches, no grains. Being able to have those cut out 
tends to help. And the interesting thing is the current diet that we have in the West is even if we do wind up eating uh, meat, for example, we are eating meat that has been eating a, uh, a high glycemic diet, which is different than meat that has been eating a uh, low glycemic diet, you know, just eating grass, for instance. And then us eating all these things that goes and causes us to have higher insulin levels uh, goes and jump starts the metabolic syndrome even if we aren't even if we aren't an overweight in fact uh, the location of the fat like even if you don't see that somebody is fat but if they happen to have uh, too much fat covering their internal organs that's you're you're pretty hosed in that situation that's very very unhealthy non-alcoholic fatty liver disease basically uh, having fructose consuming fructose does the exact same thing to your liver that consuming alcohol does and so what you would normally have been just the result of getting drunk and being an alcoholic is now uh, the result of, of, of consuming copious amounts of sugar. And the interesting thing is that because sugar is metabolized so very similarly to alcohol in the liver, you actually get all of the symptoms of drunkenness besides the alcohol crossing the, the, the uh, and messing with the, your messing with your head. So ultimately, you know, drinking is bad for you. Drinking is, 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 being a drunk is horrible. And it messes with your life and ruins it in more ways than one. The interesting thing is, you can only get so drunk, right? You can only drink so much before you run into problems. And that, sure, that amount can be bigger, but however much alcohol you can drink, I guarantee you it's possible to drink way more pop. It's possible to eat way more sugars, cakes, pies, candies, uh, whatever. And so, if we're talking about this in a dose-dependent fashion, sugar is, or can easily be made out to be more dangerous than alcohol. And so, me harping on cutting out you know, sugars, starches, and grains isn't me trying to be a killjoy. It's actually because doing that increases the quality of life tremendously. Um, and how do you um, how do you then eat while well, you eat real food? And the, the interesting thing is you need to eat smaller quantities of real food in order to get the nutritional benefits. And people can say, well, I can't afford real food. Like, that is a legitimate concern. And my, my, my wife and I and our family of four, we, uh, we operate off of a shoestring budget. So how do we uh, do this? There are certain kinds of carbohydrates that we do consume from time to time. And from time to time, my wife will make oat bread. It's lower on the glycemic index, but it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not very low. But we don't uh, do. But we don't do wheat. Uh, we don't do this. This this multi-grain thing. We do. We uh, we we avoid those kinds of things. And so it's a question of, of, of looking and seeing, well, what is it that we can do? Uh, you know, you can have a window box and grow your own uh, a lettuce or, or have your own garden and grow your own lettuce or your own little plot and grow your own, uh, you know, vegetables and something like that. Uh, you can eat more bland stuff and spice it well. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Uh, Mr. Sanderson says, this seems like important stuff. I wonder why more people don't know this. Oh, well, I guess most people aren't X and TX types. There could be other reasons, but I think society is far too hedonistic than it should be. He yes, hedonistic and short-term thinking. I mean, I'm, I'm hedonistic, but one of the things that I value is being able to live a long and productive life. Um, but especially in modern society today, with the modern food culture being what it is, it really takes careful planning and effort to get these things right. And it might be a stretch, it might be a leap of faith to say that getting it right can actually help in other aspects, but it does. It does. Another benefit of exercise. It helps with depression, it helps with futility. It helps with having low serotonin. And so you wind up seeing the world through different eyes. If, if you actually do, if you, if you do physical stuff, you wind up seeing the world through different eyes. The difficult thing is getting started. The difficult thing is establishing a new habit. And that's why incremental marginal improvement over time, preferably documented, can be very, very effective in doing this because you're not going and changing everything all at once. You're going and reversibly changing little bits at a time. And in reversibly changing these little bits, you're basically giving yourself the freedom to say, okay, uh, this is working, I'm going to continue doing that, or oh, this isn't working for me, I'm going to, to, to reiterate. And you don't actually go and have this gigantic plan that you need to adhere to, and, you know, failing once um, means that you just uh, fell off the bandwagon and now can go and resume your old ways. It's more like, well, okay, failing is part of the learning process and consistent improvement is the goal and that means sometimes you need to take a step or two back in order to take five or ten steps forward and that's okay it's completely okay we get so many thinking types that like watching this particular stream that would prefer to apply themselves to exactly what it is that they're doing and take a direct route to go from A to B, if B is what they want. And there are all these other things that make the route more indirect, but paradoxically make the going a lot easier. Um, from Caleb Beers, I learned a wonderful dish. I tried it yesterday. Uh, with the guy with whom I do running, and and it and it was and it was excellent. Uh, it's uh, frying bacon bits, and I, I I did my own a little version of it. You fr fry bacon bits in um, in butter, and then you you slice um, oh boy. The English word isn't coming to the English word isn't coming to me. Uh, it's like it's like they look like heads of lettuce, and they're about that big. Um, Brussels sprouts. You slice Brussels sprouts in half, uh, and then fry that in with the bacon. And then I made a couple modifications. Like that's that 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 was. You you, you can throw a sauce or whatever you like on it too. Uh, my modification to Caleb's recipe was uh, slicing up mushrooms. After 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 the whole thing was was starting to get cooked, I sliced up mushrooms, added more butter, and 
continue to mix up the whole thing. Now when I've said fry bacon, I mean cut it into little teeny bits with the scissors or a knife and I just had one package of bacon, one thing of, of uh, bristle sprouts, uh, and one decently sized package of of of, of um of mushrooms but here's the thing right that made a huge meal that made a gigantic meal like that would have been enough for me to have food for two days and then of course I could go and make another meal I could go and do something else because I eat once or twice a day um, one big meal suffices or one big meal and a little teeny supplementary something like you don't need to, to be having as many meals as people generally eat you don't need to be having three meals a day you don't need to be having six meals a day certainly uh, in fact the more meals you have per day the less chance you give your body to actually become insulin sensitive because you're constantly putting stuff into yourself But that's a change. And when it goes against common knowledge, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, they say. And I suppose you could turn it into an important meal if you go and you eat something um, like um, six eggs and a bowl of oatmeal. Okay, that uh, that that, or or just six eggs and uh, a serving of cottage cheese, or six eggs and turn it into a, or like a four egg omelet or something with, with, with a whole bunch of vegetables and healthy fats and meats and so on. Uh, but that's not what people normally eat for breakfast. You know, grains make their way. Even, even in healthy, otherwise healthy looking breakfast, grains make their way in. And that completely goes and messes up the insulin for the rest of the day. That's why I prefer not to eat breakfast. I prefer to drink my water, drink my coffee, and not eat anything until the afternoon. And it would take some getting used to. It takes a couple weeks for your body to get used to doing that. But once you do do that, you actually wind up... You, you improve your insulin sensitivity, making whatever meals you do eat get absorbed more thoroughly and more readily. And then you can have the meals that you do eat also be more satisfying because they all can be big. Like you don't have to worry about the size. If you're if the content is right, you will not overeat. Or at least it's very unlikely that you'll overeat. So you, you I recommend just picking something to start with. And Ultimately, I think the easiest step to start with is drinking of 750 milliliters of water in the morning before uh, before anything else, before coffee, uh, basically as you're dragging yourself out of bed. That would be the first change I would make, and I would do that. If, if, if I were to design a, 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 a little bit by little bit a habit changing program, that would be the first thing I would I, I would come up with. This is an and I know this is bad. I have a plastic bottle, right? But it, it, this is a 750 ml bottle, and I drink four of these per day. That means I'll have like what two and two thirds left at this point ah hello Jack you have arrived to vanquish my fears and plant the seed of hope plant the seed of hope okay excellent we're talking about marginal little changes that we can do 
in order to ensure or at least to improve the chances of us being of us being healthy and getting exercise even though it technically doesn't decrease our weight helps us get our biochemistry in line drinking plenty helps increase satiety helps helps us not to be perpetually dehydrated as many westerners are uh, avoiding sugars starches and grains helps keep our insulin in check and eating in a smaller window allows us to have a greater insulin sensitivity and better response to the meals that we do eat how do you effectively communicate with INFPs oh boy that's a tough one um I mean, INTPs are, um, in certain aspects, uh, very easy to get along with when talking about things on a theoretical basis. But then, when talking about things on practical levels, I, even it, it can even be difficult as a judging type to talk with an INTP. Mostly due to the fact that <clears throat> P doesn't only necessarily need to mean perceiving, although it does in the MBTI context mean that. Uh, but it also means that you see uh, the potential in many circumstances and in many aspects idealize this potential, right? And what that means in practice, idealizing the potential, paradoxically puts you into a position of not being able to achieve it. Because you always are limited by the resources that you have. And theorizing is one thing, but actually accomplishing is another. It's a completely different thing to accomplish something than it is to theorize about it. So if you're going to be cogitating and constantly contemplating about the potential, as opposed to actually going and doing something, um, you know, one one can be intellectually more pleasant. Like if 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 you don't get past if 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 you don't get past the reality that something needs to be done, um, the the the, pers the 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 the, per the perceiving aspect always wants to be there. You know, keeping your options open, so to speak. And then, and then FPs are different in in in, in than 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 TPs in that you know an I an INFP would be you know FI dominant, TE inferior, um, as opposed to INTP that would be TI dominant, FE inferior. Um, Uh, but 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 the whole but the whole point is 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 the problem of the interaction. The difficulty needs to be diagnosed, and um, ultimately, it winds up being a thing of well, okay. I, if I if if I'm improving my life and I'm changing the way the world works, and I care about other people. Uh, especially with feeling types, especially with those feeling types, um, it's important that they know where you're coming from. It's important that they know why it is you're doing what it is that you're doing. You don't even need to communicate the what you're doing all that much. Because if people resonate with the why, they will comply with the what. If they, and that's why we go, we, we go back to pathos, ethos, and logos. Right. So, 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 so you basically need to have the ethos in place. They need to know that you are trustworthy, and they need to know that you're competent. <laughs> ah. <laughs> 
funny that you should say that, Jack. It's, it's, it's actually interesting because then when you get a whole bunch of us in a room in person, it gets very quiet. It's like we don't say anything unless it's absolutely necessary to be said. And so... <laughs> or at least that's the way I found it be. It's, it's, it's really fun. It's like there's no superfluous communication. It's lovely. And so, 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 um, going back to ans to to answering Mr. Sanderson's question, or, or just kind of throwing out this 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 thought, um, having a ha valuing something, having a particular value that you're aiming at or a particular goal that you're that, 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 that you're going for a particular reason that you think something is good when you're trying to change something or you're trying to accomplish something getting people behind that getting people behind the actual the, the principle or the vision or whatever it is that's the most important thing that's that that is by far the most important thing Um, there is a lovely TED Talk that, although it isn't completely thorough, just occurred to me, there's, there, there's actually a very good TED Talk it, uh, about, about this very subject, but I'll, I'll, I'll close the, I'll close the, um, the, 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 the loops that I've opened with regard to Pathos, Ethos, and Logos, um, convincing people that you have the Ethos. Like, don't jump straight to Logos. That's the first thing. Then, doing it in a way with a lot of pathos. Being able to, like, like, like here I am dispassionately telling you this, right? I'm not being as animated as I could be. I'm not going and, you know, emotively expressing myself as much as I could be. Because this is, you know, the way I'm communicating. I'm communicating to the audience. You don't need me to be as emotive as other people would need me to be in order to get the points that I'm trying to say because you recognize that I'm saying them. You don't need me to go and tell you. I'm telling you what I'm telling you in order to answer your question because I care because that's just kind of an obvious part of our interaction. It's like I wouldn't answer your question. I wouldn't be streaming if I didn't care. And you recognize that and you know that and so we can just go and you know, get to, get to business and talk about whatever it is that we have to talk about because we have that understanding implicitly. Well, if this understanding isn't implicit in another circumstance, it needs to then be explicitly said. And as long as it doesn't get to be implicit, it needs to be explicitly repeated. And so you wind up spending a majority of the time that you do trying to accomplish something, repeating the same thing over and over again. Now, I will go and find the TED Talk to link so that you can uh, open it in a new tab or, or book bookmark later. I'm trying to remember. There we go. Okay, found it. Found it. Found it. I'm pretty sure that's it. I'm pretty sure that's the link to the TEDx talk. It's in crappy low resolution, but it's a big step in solving your problem, so I hope 
that it is useful and enjoyable. The difficulty being the J-type, being the go-getter type, being the one that constantly has, especially, you know, if you have if you have NI going and, and doing a lot of the heavy lifting and having it all be implicit, for people that it's not implicit, so that basically means anybody that's not uh, an INTJ, INFJ, ENTJ, or ENFJ, constantly hammering down the same thing over and over and over again is a necessity. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, the actual logical stuff is important, but it's not ever going to get through unless you start with ethos and pathos. Start with why and communicate it in an inspiring fashion. Like learning rhetoric would be like you don't need I, I'm sure Mr. Sanderson you don't need grammar and you don't need logic. I'm sure you've got those down very well. Grammar, logic, grammar, dialectic. But rhetoric, rhetoric is incredibly important. Uh, Aristotle wrote a piece on rhetoric. It's a wonderful piece. I would recommend reading it at least once a week. Just sit down and, 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 and go through it so that you read it on you know a weekly basis. Or if you can't do that, do it on a monthly basis. Because there's so much to be said that needs to be internalized. And... It gets forgotten. Look, I've written things myself that I need to go and reread, on account of the fact that I've synthesized it, but I've I've not made it into a habit as well as I could have. So I'll stop beating that dead horse now. I'll stop beating the dead horse now. I just find another dead horse to beat. Like, what's wrong with me? Right here, I take central nervous system stimulant. It comes in the form of roasted beans that get ground up into a... Uh, into a grainy powdery substance through which hot water is percolated. <laughs> Emotion sways. Oh, yeah. Rhetoric persuades, logic instructs, and emotion sways. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love this chat. I love this chat. This is so... Yeah, it's instructive. It's very instructive. And I really appreciate the company, too. Mm -hmm. Who is you? You're just Arden. Uh, is it Mr. Sanderson? Is it me? Is it the mysterious other person here that isn't saying anything? Or maybe all of us? I don't know. We'll see. Probably is all of us. I'll get a little more central nervous system stimulant. And then we can continue. With bigger and better things than coffee. Though few such things exist. At least in the world according to me. Few such things exist in the world according to me. Actually, no. Central nervous system stimulants are not necessary. The longest it's ever taken me to get off coffee has been four days. 
longest I've been off coffee since starting to drink coffee was about half a year. So it's completely possible to do that. It's just I've gotten to the point where um, I wind up doing so much. And, and I suppose I should probably take this as a, as a sign that I need more sleep. Um, but I can just accomplish a lot more by narrowing my sleeping window a little bit as opposed to being in my natural state and needing night hours of sleep a night. Though I've noticed that um, I, I've noticed that sleeping multiple times per day for shorter intervals also can help if, if, the, if one's schedule permits. Like sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll sleep for one and a half or three hours before streaming. And then three hours after streaming. And then I'll go and continue with the rest of my day. And then I wind up getting the, 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 the freshly awoken low ADP in my brain. Uh, a sense more often during the day. But that's also kind of difficult to pull off if you're not writing your own schedule. But then it's also possible, like let's say you 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 work a normal schedule or go to school in a normal time period, you in between, you know, nine and five or whatever. You get home, you you know, eat some vegetables, get some healthy fats, uh you no know, shower, get comfortable, whatever you need to do, take a nap. You sleep for sleep for an hour and a half or three hours or something. Sleep for one or two sleep cycles, then get up, do your thing, and then uh, uh, sleep at night again, or uh, go to bed early. You no, know, get get home at six, get to bed by seven, get up at eleven thirty, uh, do some work over the course of the middle of the night. Or, you know, get up at, get up at two, you know, uh, get, get to bed at, get, get to bed at eight and get up at two, do an hour or two of work and then get back to sleep and then sleep until morning again. That's another, that's another option. I mean, you, there, there are so many such options available that people actually took more often, uh, in the past. People... Uh, people did not necessarily sleep all the way through the night way back when it was in, in fact assumed that a part of the night was basically okay everyone gets up you know write something read something make something does something has sex whatever it might be and then goes back to bed that was understood to be a normal part of life at some point this whole consecutive eight hour sleep business is yet another consequence of mid to late modernity. You know, wanting to systematize everything. Wanting to um, turn life into a more assembly line process. And so it's interesting being a judging type, being someone who likes to organize, uh, to have things organized, to have things be efficiently inefficient. To be more organic in nature, to be more or, or organismic in nature as opposed to as ordered as absolutely possible. To allow the, the, the inefficiencies or the things that would be on a micro scale viewed as inefficient when added up over time to increase the efficiency of the macro scale processes, those sorts of things can be very helpful. Uh, ISFPs and ESFPs. I try to pull you down with their FI morality. Well, it also makes them very easy to discuss with if you do wind up sharing the morality. Or, if you wind up being a con man just to deceive them. Right, That's what lots of people do. They go and they figure out what the right buzzwords are, and then they just say them. And you have them like putty in your hand. 
hot traditionalists that rely on their feelings. That's what my wife, my, my wife's an ISFJ. An ISFJ, oh boy. And that meant like the first four years of interaction between the two of us. But especially like year two. Was full of a lot of overcoming emotional hurdles to accepting logical ideas. Like my wife was implicitly a socialist when I met her. I recognized that she was intelligent. I knew that it would just be a phase assuming that she was actually exposed to the correct thing. But she grew up in Finland where, you know, people think that all sorts of things I would consider bad are good. And so, a, a lot of what winds up... Here's another thing. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that I, that I jumped in the middle of a thought, but, but here's, here's something that I've noticed. And this works well with my wife. You can't do this because I disagree with it. Yeah, that's, or that's not nice. That's not right. Oof. You need to engage their imagination. They have it. It might not be as vivid. But they have it. And you don't do it in the terms of an argumentation. Imagine if. What if. Then you postulate things. What if. What if. What if. What if. What if. And in constantly having these what if statements. You know you can say well I'm not going to force you to believe anything. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But let's do a mind game right now. Let's or, or or let's let's um let's do a thought experiment. Let's let's um imagine that this might be the case. And then you go and say how things actually are, right? Imagine this might be the case. Imagine and, and, and then you go and you and, and you paint the picture. And you don't expect quick acquiescence. That's, that's, that's the other thing. That's the other thing. Like, you and I, we would be able to go and have a conversation. And one of us could logically persuade the other of a point of view that we have. Uh, doubly so if it's something that the other person hasn't considered all that much. And we both happen to share the same kind of mental framework. It would just kind of make sense. And it would be easy. And we could get you know, what most people would consider a day's worth of conversing, eight hours worth of conversing done in under 20 minutes, and it'd be easy. Um, this sort of a process for other people takes time. This sort of a process for other people takes a great deal of time because they need time to process. They need time to look at all these different pieces to, to, to cogitate the what-ifs. And then when they go through life and they see that the what-ifs actually match up with reality, they've already gone, come to the conclusions of the what-ifs. They've gone and come to the right conclusions. Now it's just a question of showing them through experience, through sensory experience, that these theoretical constructs that you've posited in the past are actually the way things are. It takes time. But that is how the majority of people need to be communicated to. They need to be given time to cogitate. They won't have their minds changed. They will change their minds themselves. You can't change minds. You can only ever open them. But in opening the minds... And paradoxically, in giving people back their autonomy, in, 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 in making it abundantly obvious that you can make this choice, you can choose whether to believe this or not, they will be much more likely to actually acquiesce to the belief. You always need to be open to perspectives that oppose yours. 
Well, that's a, a that's an interesting assertion, and I'm going to oppose that particular perspective. But since you believe it, you need to be open to my opposing your perspective that says that you always need to be open to perspectives that oppose yours. Uh, I think that always, um, always should probably be replaced with some other word. That's what I think. I, th I, I think that uh, once something has already been established, like once you've gone through the point, of having been rigorous enough and having ha having come to a conclusion going through the exact same argumentation and having people trying to convince you the exact same way that you were not convinced before is an exercise in futility it's like, here's, here's the documentation for how I got to my views. If your view is anywhere in this documentation and you don't have anything to add, then keep your mouth shut because I don't want to hear it. I, at least that, you know, it comes across as very irreverent and very horrible. And very INTJ-esque. Um, but if there are new perspectives and there are new things and, 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 and things that we actually haven't considered, then yes, yeah, certainly. Having one's mind open to those kinds of perspectives are very, can be very, very enlightening. Oh boy! Hey, I know. I'll 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 play devil's advocate. I'll play devil's advocate. Now I'll play devil's advocate for Mr. Sanderson. Uh. Yes, okay, okay. I, I don't need to do that anymore because you went and, qu and qualified with a knowing how to gather new information to update the pre-existing framework. Okay, I don't need to say anything. I don't need to say anything. And yeah, well, here's the thing. I will also argue what is right and what is wrong. I have a very, um, I have a very rigid idea of what is right and what is wrong. And though I don't completely agree with Kant's categorical imperative, I think that it's a very good place to start. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it, 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 it makes a great deal of sense. And that's why there are very few things like I I don't think that I, I I don't think that murder is right. It's the taking of an innocent life. I don't think that rape is right. You know, non-consensual sexual interactions. I don't think that fraud is right. Uh, giving people inadequate information to make deals. I don't think theft is right. I don't think slavery is right. Uh, th th there are these basic <coughs> human rights things. That, that that I think take precedence. Basically, you will have an incredibly difficult time convincing me that violating other people's right to life, liberty, or property is ever a good idea. And I take that as 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 an absolute. And, and, and if you go and you say, well, it doesn't matter, we can go and force Bobby to give up his right to his property in order that Jane might have her right to her medical care. So no, you can't, because you can't force Bobby to do that. You can attempt to persuade Bobby, but you don't use the, you don't use the government, you don't use guns, you don't do that. And if people want to ruin their lives, they need to have the freedom to do that. If people want to not ruin their lives, they need to have the freedom to do that. But then the line gets drawn when, you know, feel free to swing your fists around, but your right to swing your fist around ends where my nose begins. 
You don't. Mr. Sanderson, you don't use logic to validate basic moral axioms. What if we're in a simulation? What if we're in a simulation? What if we're in a vat? Exactly. And, 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 and ultimately, ultimately, base it upon your own personal axioms, ultimately, one of the axioms that I have is obviously I, I am a Christian. I have a Christian set of values. But the only ones that I think are okay to impose on others by force are these things like uh, don't, don't murder, don't rape, don't steal, don't defraud, uh, don't enslave, you know, things of that nature. Um, in the, in the, you know, don't engage in, in, in non-consensual activities. And then, of course, you wind up getting into, in, into a few tricky areas, like, okay, when can a child consent to something? If a child doesn't consent to eating her broccoli and wants to eat candy only, uh, is it the responsibility of the parents to give her candy or broccoli? So, so, so you get into these fringe cases, like in, in parenting, and and that's where I think that the, that hierarchical structures are useful, you know, in the home. But I think that they should be very small, and very surmountable, as opposed to very pervasive, in every aspect of society, having government's hand, uh, guiding things, right? So, so, but but all of that is is predicated upon the idea of people's right to life, liberty, and property, and then going and looking at circumstances through that particular lens and applying the consistent logical framework to everything to try to figure out how to minimize intrusion upon people's rights there too. And ultimately, uh, Ultimately, since we only have control over ourselves, you know, being a, the minimum nuisance that we can be to other people is important. I believe morality is universal too. But then you wind up having questions like abortion. Then you wind up having questions like uh, right to life versus right to liberty. Or sometimes even right to life. Okay, so, 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 so immediately when you run into that question, you wind up having people on both sides of the, of, of the, of the coin that both say that they're moral. One argues pro-life, one argues pro-choice. But what side do you take and why? I believe morality is universal. I am pro-life. And... I am pro-life enough to believe that it should actually be against the law to, to, to have an abortion. Like, it's not just my personal preference, but I believe that the life of someone should be spared. I'm, and I'm not going to take any of the straw man arguments to the face that say something along the lines of, oh, you're just trying to be oppressive. No. No, no, no. I'm merely saying that one's right to have sex with whomever one wants, however one wants, and so on, uh, does not supersede another's right to life. But interestingly, as a Christian, right, I can, I can, I can kind of deduce, you know, rights to life, liberty, and property. But the fact of the matter is, I, I, as a Christian, I would not even necessarily believe that I deserve it on account of who I am, or on account of, you know, being sinful, being bad, having some sort of evil in me. But, 
but uh, but still it's it's something that you know there there is some dignity in being a human being there is something that makes us special aristotle says it's reason uh, the bible says it's a soul etc so but when coming from a purely materialistic standpoint you can't do that then ultimately all you ever have your mora to, to base your morality on is your feelings Of course, moral relativism is inherently flawed. You can say, I absolutely state that morality is relative. Um, oops. I'd say, uh, Mr. Sanders, I'd say, yeah, 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 we can. We can, and, and it... it sometimes involves a lot of, 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 of contingency planning and a lot of thinking. And sometimes there are an awful lot of no-win situations. Or like, what is the shiniest of the turds I have to pick from? You know, picking from the shiniest of turds is not is is not a pleasant process, but sometimes it must be sometimes it must be done. One of the turds can be not doing anything. Uh, the other turd can be minimizing damage. Yeah. It's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to pull off. But I think it can be done in most circumstances. I would, uh, there is some, um, I, 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 I love this philosophy teacher. He, he was like the one I really, really enjoyed. His name was, uh, Larry Masick. He taught at Ohio Dominican University. He was, back, back, back when I was there, he was very, 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 very good. I liked him more than all the other people in the philosophy department. I'm 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 going to make a uh, a maximum. Don't I, 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 I unless you have very very strong shoulders. Don't major in philosophy. Job prospects are pretty near nil if you have the right views. You're going to be fighting with people all the time who have the wrong views. Who say because my fifis, and that's your philosophical argument, right? It it's like you might as well go and you know get one of those blenders on a stick, just cut just cut like a ten centimeter hole in your head, and you just <laughs> no, <laughs> much better <laughs> chatting in the comment section of. Caleb's and Matt's YouTube videos <laughs> or starting a channel of your own or reading philosophy of your own is starting your own parlor. Um, institutionalized philosophy education is cancer. It is horrible. I, I mean, I don't want to be nasty about it, but it, it, it's like I don't see any good coming of it. I don't see any good coming of it. I mean, you're already dealing with psychologists. Uh, you're already dealing with psychologists, which means that you need to constantly tell them to dig their head out of their butt if you want to actually get any good information from the field whatsoever and want to actually be able to be of any use to anyone. I'm not going to say that, that, that psychology is a bad field because it's a very good field, but the lack of scientific rigor and the way that people just... misrepresent statistics, the way people just you know, pull stuff out of their behind and 
say, well, I have a PhD in psychology, so I can just make this assertion because I'm an, an expert. You know, but at least you have some rigor of science where, you know, you can write a paper and 20 years down the line, people will realize that the numbskull that you wrote the paper to disprove was actually wrong. A leftist ENFP who hides behind a TE mask. Yes. Oh, yeah. Although, I've noticed, I, I actually have a few ENFP friends. I'm trying to think. One of, the, one of them is a communist, and the rest of them are almost as far right, if, if you want to call it that, as I am. Um, but but in terms of in terms of being a philosopher, I suppose you, I mean being an INTJ, you could just go and write a bunch of aphorisms. But you still have to figure out how to pull, you know do your dissertation, like without getting called, basically. And the leftist DNFP, though, that would... Yes. I mean, that would be... Guaranteed to get tenure. Guaranteed to get tenure if you get through and get a job. That would work. That would work. Um, but don't, 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 don't go into philosophy. Be a philosopher. But don't... Oh. Don't don't get an institutionalized education in philosophy until we've gone and re revamped the institutions. You see, that that's the other thing. I'm the INT jam. I'm like, don't do that. That's the way it is. Period. Whereas if you were to say that to, say, Caleb or something, he wouldn't have given it in terms of, of, of advice. He would have been much more um, pleasant about it. Yeah, I'm the jerk that just says, you know, just, you know, cut a hole and take a blender, take a blender on a stick and <laughs> your brains before you go and get a degree <laughs> in philosophy. But philosophy is fun. Like, as a subject. Being able... And, and then in terms of just the sheer utility in life and the, the sheer relevance, philosophy is amazing. ENFP. Is Dyson an ENFP? I don't know. It's a good question. It's a very good question. Hey, maybe, hey, I should write, hey, guys, guys, you want to write a book of aphorisms and then just split the profits depending on how many we uh, write? It's like we can go and coordinate a Google Doc, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that could be fun. And then we can market it and just see how many people buy it. You want to do that? Just like INTJ aphorisms from the right wing? I don't know. Or just INTJ aphorisms, period. Because... You know, I don't think we're concerned about football. <laughs> well, football's fun. Football's fun, but it definitely doesn't take the place of philosophy.
Like we can start our own publishing company and we'll just market to everyone on Facebook. And then get and then get an email list going for all the people that buy our products. And then just keep on sending like re, re, like refreshing good good stuff both going back to the classics and inserting aphorisms and stuff of our own that would be fun and we could have like reflections on philosophy in the modern times better a lobotomy than a degree in philosophy or something like that don't do what has already been tried and failed. Have people tried this and failed? Or are you thinking about something else? Is that like a... Are you talking about it as an aphorism? Odd. Uh, there's another word for that. Kind of oddness. Jack, it's called intelligence. Um... <clears throat> <laughs> uh, there's a there's a razor, and it's not com it's not completely right, I would say, but 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 it's it's just pretty good razor. I can't think of who said it right now. There's basically, if you want to tell the intelligence of somebody, look at what they talk about. You talk about other people. This is an unintelligent conversation. You talk about things, it becomes intelligent. You talk about ideas, all of a sudden it's it's up there. I I can't recall the exact, uh, but I'm sure you can go and search it and find the find the actual saying. You know, the 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 more people talk about abstract ideas and so on, the more intelligent they they they, they tend to be, and the more they basically gossip about other people. Talking about irrelevant crap about who done, who done what, when, where. Um, that's a more base level conversation. Would I debate Alan Watts if he was still with? I would debate anyone. I would debate anyone. That is. Pay for my travel expenses and, uh, you know, make it so that I could actually, you know, pay, pay, pay for my travel expenses, pay for my time because, you know, I have a family that I need to feed and so on, but I will go anywhere and debate anyone. Abstract concepts are fun. Abstract concepts are great. And then the application thereof, going, going, going back through the degrees of abstraction, thinking what are the what are the consequences? That's what makes them difficult to grasp, is because they're so so consequential in nature. Like, well, if this really is true, then what does that say about this? What does that say about that? What does that say about all these other circumstances? Um. Maybe, maybe that's actually. It. What would you what would you say if I said it's simple but not simplistic? Would you think that that would do you think that would um, be a reasonable um, addition to what you've said? Simple but not simplistic. Raving about the Kardashians? Alright, when, when, when stuff like that occurs, raving about the Kardashians, you know, <clears throat> and, and I don't mean this to be irreverent in any aspect. 
But I, I think that hell would be experienced a little bit differently by the different personality types. And by INTJs, it is this absolute inanity. Just complete, inescapable inanity. So, like, if you're in a room and you can't escape, you just can't get out for some reason, with people that only want to talk about the Kardashians or... I mean, you could even, you could even technically turn that into an interesting conversation. I mean, it'd be a stretch, but I suppose one could pull that off. Um, but 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 want to have inane conversations about the Kardashians or the shape of whoever's butt, um, or whatever. Um, then just like you just kind of wait for the walls to burst into sulfurous flames, and then you just have this horned figure coming and saying, "Ha ha ha." The joke's on you. You've been in hell all this time. You've been in hell all along. I just didn't think I'd, re I'd reveal it to you until now. It's like, yeah, well, that could easily be the case. Or, like, having to deal with the consequences of other people's inanity. Well, I mean, I don't care about the Kardashians. I don't care. What would INTP hell be like? Oh, boy. Um... I think that uh, lack of freedom would probably be a big bit of it. Like, like somehow knowing that your brain can go somewhere and then not being able, like c complete and total uh, brain block. Or being subject to constantly travel and never find anything. The DMV. <laughs> yes! Oh boy, the DMV would be hell for anybody that doesn't actually, you know, can't just go sit down in a crowd and be like, oh, I want to just talk to that person about whatever inane thing they want to talk about. Yeah, the, D the DMV could be, you know, the place in hell where INTJ... Actually, no, INTJs and INTPs can never meet in hell. That's the other rule, because they will immediately begin ameliorating the situation for the other. That, 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 cannot, that cannot take place. INTJs cannot meet INTPs in hell. INTJs cannot meet ENTPs in hell. ENTJs run hell. No, ENTJs don't run hell. ISFPs run hell. Uh, because ENTJs would want to run hell. Uh, yes, ISFPs are in charge of hell. ENTJs are in the bottom rung of the totem pole. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can come up with all sorts of different things about what hell is like for different kinds of people. But INTP hell is actually the most difficult to come up with because it needs to be shallow. It, it needs to be it needs to be incredibly shallow either that or deep with absolutely nothing like utter oblivion and the inability to 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 focus on anything other than utter oblivion do I think Satan is ISFP? <laughs> kept in separate containers within view of each other with with masks over their faces so they can't learn to read each other's lips. Of course they can come up with a with a system of of eye movements to communicate. Um, but I don't know, yeah, something like that. Just just knowing that everyone is there. Yeah. Um do I think Satan is an ISFP? I would go probably, if we're talking about any F type, um, E N F P would be the most likely F type. 
ENTP or ENTJ would be the most likely. Um, yeah, I, I would I would say Satan is an NT. Satan is, is something NT. Probably ENTP or ENTJ. Has to has to, has to be E. I mean, it's just the question is, is does the ENTJ, probably ENTP, or ESTP, or ESTJ. T is definitely a letter. Okay. So now we have to think about a probability. Okay. ENTP and ESTJ are on the top of the stack. And who knows, maybe he has multiple personality disorder. That could explain a lot because, you know, he winds up having to be multiple things to multiple people. But if he has multiple personality disorder, then maybe it, we, do, we do go back to INFP. I don't know. Interesting, interesting thing. That would actually be a, you know, in a class about Jung or something. Like that, like that would actually be a fun paper to write. The opposite personality type of God. Good, 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 good way of, of thinking it. Okay, so Jesus was definitely an INFJ. So the shadow would be NFP. The complete opposite would be... You just keep the J. Like, the complete opposite of the function stack, you keep the J. So ESTJ. Opposite function stack would be ESTJ. Because Jesus is INFJ. ESTJ, that could be it. That actually could be it. A hyper, hyper, hyper intelligent ESTJ. It has to be more intelligent than any human being in existence. That's the only caveat. Actually, that's, that's a really cool... That, that's, that's a really cool... That's a really cool question. I get a whole bunch of people that's, that do MBTI and have them argue about the personality type of Satan. That's fun. <sighs> this has been incredibly fun. This has been incredibly fun up to this point. Oh, well, lovely. Lovely. Mr. Thorbjörnsen got a new computer. I'm very happy for him. And I'm, al I'm already going to, uh, to, unfortunately, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to completely kill this conversation, but Mr. Thorbjörnsen is attempting to begin a career in chess he's attempting to begin a career doing chess things and so he went and bought himself a computer for streaming so um, if if you guys are um, wanting to encourage somebody uh, send the dude some messages on Quora and um, send a little encouragement his way. Uh, doing do, doing streaming on a consistent basis, especially at the very beginning, is not easy. Um, 
And given that he is... I mean, I'm more introverted than he is. But given the fact that he has less experience doing things in front of people in general than I do, you know, just any bit of encouragement could, could, could help. So if you know how to get a hold of him, and I'm not going to broadcast here on the stream how to do it. If you know how to um, get a hold of you, then I would highly recommend maybe even making a habit of sending him encouragement you know, on a, on a weekly basis or what have you. Um, just given the fact that he wants to turn that into his livelihood, if he want, that he wants to, to, to turn that into his, um, his way of putting food on the table. Yeah, he's, he's, he's planning on beginning doing chess streaming. Uh, that's, that's, that's one of the first things, but he just got his new machine, and I think he's still in the process of, you know, doing all the planning and all this other stuff. Um, but don't let him get into analysis paralysis. Just please help me encourage him. Uh, he's, he's an amazing guy, and um, I really, I, I really would like to, I would really like him to be able to uh, succeed in what he decides to set out and do. I mean, obviously he's going to be working as a chef for a while. Obviously he's going to be, uh, you know, needing to put in the time and, 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 and do things to put food on the table now. But if there's anything that we can think of in order to help him kickstart his, his, uh, more interesting creative process thing if you can think of anything i highly encourage you to 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 do it because well i don't think that i <laughs> even if it winds up being like a flop it's like oops a bad idea whatever i you know i i think i'll still appreciate the uh attempt and then also for him to know that there are other people that care that And then if he gets mad uh, as to why in the world are you telling this, you know, I don't think he will. But, 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 but if, but if, if there is ever a thing, you can just point the finger at me and say, yeah, it's, it's Matt's fault. He went and told me to encourage you. And then in, if he decides to get mad at me, I can be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I don't see anything going bad. <laughs> I think he's watched a whole bunch of stuff already. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing will be just for him to find out what kind of persona he needs to project like what what aspect of him of himself to accentuate basically getting the getting the ethos getting the pathos and obviously the logos is there you got I mean it's chess um biggest thing like watching others do tutorials looking at how they do it looking at how the popular people are popular and then finding out what makes, you know, um, finding out if there's anything that kind of binds them all together. Look, if you want to see a chess channel that grew very, very quickly, Agan Mator's chess channel grew incredibly quickly, and he did something very, very simple. It was just game analysis, one bit by little bit. Um... I really like Agad Matar's channel. I subscribed to him a long, long, long time ago. But 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 uh, I, I found what he did to be really cool. And in fact, if I wind up taking a nap or something, I'll go and I will watch one chess video and then put it you know on repeat. I'll just repeat the same chess video over and over again while I'm taking a nap. It's fun because he's just ah, so relaxing. Agad Matar. Um, sure, let me, uh, let me open. I don't know if, if Yulva yet has his chess channel, so if that's what, who you were talking about. And Agad Mator also has a, um, another channel. 
I think it's Hearthstone or something like that. Uh, but nobody watches that. Most people watch his chess stuff. This is Agad Mator's uh, chess channel. Definitely worth a subscribe. His, uh, he's, I, I would say his earlier videos are actually better than his later ones because his now he's basically trying all sorts of new things to see if he can get more subscriber engagement. Some of them are good. Others are just like, we're weird, but, um, I mean, that's my opinion on the matter. Uh, I, I especially like his newest thing, which is a challenge that he gives people. It's like, uh, go and, you know, post to Instagram a picture of you on, say, leechess.org going and uh, winning a game with six knights of your own color on the board. Or win a game with all eight pawns. Like, don't lose a single pawn in your in, in your game. He gives all these weird, weird challenges for you to, to go and do. I think it's cool. I mean, I'm not doing any because I don't have the time to go and sit down and play all the chess that it takes to accomplish them. But, but I, but I think that those are fun. But his actual game analyses, his his actual just going through his big, huge historical games or cool tournaments and and just going and saying, well, okay, if this, then that, and then just pulling up the analysis board on Lee Chess and, and and streaming. He does an excellent job. He has the perfect. You know, late night radio DJ voice. He's he's amazing. Very, very, very good chess channel. This has been quite pleasant up to this point. We'll be having about 20 more minutes of stream, uh, or 20 or less minutes of stream. So if there's anything else that you'd like to talk about in the remainder of the time, uh, I'm down for it. I'm down for it. Well, it seems like we, our viewership is now dwindling. So our under 20 minutes is probably going to evolve to under five. you guys for showing up it's been incredibly pleasant it's um i really appreciate uh the opportunity to uh to hang out like this i'll be doing uh our last stream this week uh tomorrow same time or preferably half an hour earlier than i was actually able to get this one started 4.30 a.m. my time, or um, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time, or whatever time it happens to be at any other places in the world. I will continue with uh, book four of the Iliad, and a few other, and a few other things. Uh, there are some uh, 
principles of uh, economics and some principles of health that I thought would also be kind of fun to go over. Uh, of course, it might be subject to change if something else really, really interesting uh, comes up that I thought that I think would be um, uh, good to share. So with that said, uh, talk to you later. Bye.